Good morning. My name is John Hauerwas, and I serve as the minister here at Skidaway Community Church. On behalf of our congregation, I offer you my warmest welcome this morning, whether you are joining us here in person or online. We are grateful that you are here taking part in worship with us. I am pleased to report that the power supply to the Overflow Coffee Shop in the back parking lot is now up and running, which means that we are getting closer to a grand opening. We will keep you updated regarding that hard opening date, which is fast approaching. Uh, initially, the shop will serve customers from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m., and adjustments will be made in time, of course, related to things like traffic flow. We will keep you informed Monday through Friday, 7 to 2, and we'll update you about that hard opening soon. We are excited about the launch of this new endeavor. Throughout the summer, SCC is collecting peanut butter and jelly for donation to Safe Shelter. You can find the donation boxes in the main hallway near the main office of our church, and we thank you in advance for your generosity and your contributions. This evening, we encourage you to join us at 7.45 p.m. at Delegal Marina for an informal worship experience, of course, featuring the beautiful music of Ed Ayers. Uh, we're doing something very similar to what was offered last year when Ed was serving as your interim minister. This will be my first experience with this particular service with you, and I am more than excited about it. If you would like to come out at 7.30, there will be music offered at that time as we lead forward to the 7.45 start time. We hope to see you then. I will be on vacation beginning this Tuesday through Sunday, and Reverend Ayers has agreed to step up to the plate to rise to the challenge to be both the preacher and the music leader next Sunday. We are grateful for his leadership. And finally, I have three questions for you this morning as we center our hearts and minds and prepare ourselves for a time of morning worship. Number one, what are the factors that worry us, that distract us, or that monopolize our attention? Number one, what are the factors that worry us, that distract us, or that monopolize our attention? Number two, what do we really mean when we ask, do you not care? Have you ever said that? And what do we really mean when we ask, do you not care? And number three, what are the necessary components of Christian discipleship? What are the necessary components Christian discipleship. Friends, let us prepare ourselves now to worship the living God. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship. In your wisdom, O oh God, you call us to worship you. We gather alive to the word of God. You call us to be fully alive with your life abundant ready to listen and respond with heart, soul, strength, and mind. We listen alive to the word of God. You call us to be always watchful for your word of wisdom, sometimes startling and unexpected, sometimes still and quiet, but always dwelling among us. We watch and wait for the word of God.
share with you the peace of Christ. For those worshiping with us in person, we encourage you to share the peace of Christ with those seated near you and to sign and pass the friendship pad at this time. Friends, let us pray. Grant us this day, O God, not to be overtaken by anxious thoughts that can make us feel that you are not near, but rather give us the chance to sit at your feet to enjoy every word and every musical note that we may feel and experience your real presence and in turn live out that presence within our families, our communities, our jobs, and our schools. Prepare us as we journey as your people to worship and to obey. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the image of the invisible God, and the firstborn over all creation. Amen. Together, let us now offer the prayer that Christ taught us, saying in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would ask you to remain seated this morning for our response. Uh, You will be familiar with it. Some will call it the doxology. Uh, In fact, there are countless doxologies. It is a doxology. Uh, That word, incidentally, is from the Greek doxa, which means glory or honor, and logia, which means word. So it is speaking or singing a word of glory and honor to God. Let us sing together, and I think being familiar with this, uh, let's do it twice through, okay?
mercy gives those who serve full of God. Ship with us. in our routines, so busy with our daily chores that we forget to take the time to stop and breathe, to look up and to notice the creation you have given and the way it speaks about your love and passion for your people. We do not take the time to listen for your words while reading the Bible, while listening to music, while talking to friends, and we become worried and upset about many things. Sometimes, O oh God, we behave like Mary. We devote our time to looking up, thinking that everything we are commanded to do is to love God, and we forget to serve our neighbor and to commit our time to the concrete work of the church, forgetting to get our hands dirty. Please join me in the call to confession. God of balance, help us. Forgive us when we do not know when to be workers and when to be hearers. In your mercy, heal our worries and our judgments so that we can, indeed, keep the best part. In the name of our loving Master, amen. When we move away from God, we make ourselves strangers and enemies of righteousness. Yet now we have been reconciled to God by the death and resurrection of Christ. Now we can live at peace and be thankful. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Bring your gifts and your talents. Bring your sacrifice of praise to the Lord. Bring them with prayers and shouts of thanksgiving to celebrate God's faithfulness. Offering plates may be found as you exit the sanctuary. Online giving is also available. Would you please pray with me? Let us bow our heads. Giver of life, wonderful are your works. You are compassionate and loving. And you embrace all of your creatures. You conceived our well-being and bore the Christ for us and for them. You did not forsake us when death's darkness enshrouded the earth. We live today thanks to your love. Hope of the world, we rely on your mercy. Continue to grant us hospice where we can live secure from harm. Help us to find in Christ the anchor of our faith, the haven of calm waters amid unsettling times. Root us and ground us in his teachings so that when the wind blows, we remain steadfast. When the stormy seas threaten, we do not desert you. When we are tossed to and fro, we may remain upright in the conviction that Christ died to free us from ultimate destruction. Custodian of the future, we depend on your grace. Blend our thoughts with your thoughts and leaven us so that our days on earth reflect your splendor. Renew us with your Holy Spirit and align all we do with your will for us. When we are depressed, be with us to lift us up. When we stray from your desire, frustrate our errant behavior. When our feet are light, dance with us. When we shout with joy, hear our praise. 
You have formed our days before we even knew that they existed. How precious to us are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn is number 624. Uh, I greet thee whom I sure redeem our art. The original words are often attributed in the French language to John Calvin. You'll see that this hymn begins in the singular person. The second, third, and fourth verses are directly to God, and the fourth celebrates our unified hope. Let us stand as we sing number 624. Open our hearts and minds, O God, so that we can understand the fullness of your word. Fill us with the light of the Holy Spirit and bless us to share the word proclaimed today. In the name of Christ, the word revealed. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the New Testament book of Colossians. The first chapter, beginning with the 15th verse, I invite you now to hear the Word of God. 
He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and Hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He is now reconciled in his fleshly body through death so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. And I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is He whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson comes to us from Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you were worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The pages of our scriptures are filled with all kinds of remarkable events. There we find things like miracles, profound teachings told in surprising ways, things that stir us to action, things that deepen our faith, things that remind us that we can even be resurrected body and soul. And amid all of these different accounts, there 
are some, of course, that are particularly memorable. I'm reminded this morning of Jesus and his disciples in that account that you likely remember. They are traveling by boat. When a storm emerges rather quickly and threatens to overwhelm them. Soon, powerful waves surge at them from every angle. The waves are sweeping onto the deck of this boat, enveloping the scene with the uncertainty of chaos and desperation. And soon enough, the call goes out. This is a moment for all hands on deck. And yet, as even leaders are prone to do, Jesus in that moment is, well, he's sleeping. He's sleeping rather soundly, we are told, on a cushion in the stern. The contrast here is stunning. Jesus represents the peacefulness of one who fears not. Meanwhile, the disciples are overcome with unbridled anxiety. In fact, they are drenched in it. And as the urgency of this moment flows through their panicked voices, they rouse Jesus from sleep, shouting, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care? care this question is often one of the low hanging fruit of uh, personal attacks just ask the exiled president of Sri Lanka or the outgoing prime minister of the United Kingdom as each of these leaders are driven from power, the question remains the same. Do you not care that your people are suffering? We all know that this question, do you not care, is equal parts put down and call to action. A sort of naming and blaming while laying the challenges of the nation at the leader's feet. Or stated just a little bit differently, when the ship is sinking, there is usually a sense that more could have been done, right? As evidenced by the multitude of fingers that are now pointing all the way to the top. And yet, no matter how numerous a leader's faults or failings. Most crises, as we all know, are so complex that there is plenty of blame to go around. Just take this example of Jesus and his disciples on those stormy seas. Jesus did not summon the storm into being, did he? No. Of course not. And he didn't design or even build the vessel that now transports them from one destination to another, right? No, of course, he didn't. But all of this is irrelevant when everyone is working tireless, tirelessly to preserve life while the leader is, well, sleeping. In this moment, they need him to put his gifts and skills to good use. They need to see from him some public display of leadership. In this moment, they are counting on him to rise from sleepfulness, to, to rise up and to encourage and guide his team as they navigate these very stormy waters as they make their way through this challenge. Jesus, they urge. It's now or never. But they have an odd way of expressing that, don't they? They don't 
gently wake him in this moment and calmly explain, Jesus, we need you. No, instead, they challenge him and they put him to the test asking, do you not care? Which is, of course, just another way of wondering, do you truly see me? Do you see my anguish? Do you see my hopes? Do you see the current predicament which threatens to overwhelm my life? Jesus, do you truly see me as I am, exactly as I am in this moment, in the here and now, and do you have the power to help? It's always fascinating to me how common themes weave themselves through the passages of our scriptures. And our second lesson this morning is a great example of that. I hope that you will see what I mean. Admittedly, this passage is far less dramatic than the account of Jesus calming the stormy seas. Here there is no storm here there is no panic. Here there is no near-death experience. And yet the underlying question remains the same. Here we read about two sisters. Their names are Martha and Mary. We soon discover that their relationship is seriously fractured and that it is buckling under the tension. Martha, in this narrative, assumes the traditional role of the host. She extends an invitation to Jesus, and she requests that he might come into their home and join them for a meal. Each of these women, it is all too evident, have the best of intentions. Martha is hard at work giving, getting everything set up and in place and in order. She sets the table. She prepares the meal. She cleans the dishes. She provides everything that is expected of a good host in that day and age in an effort to ensure that Jesus is well fed and that he is well cared for. For us, Martha models the valuable ministry of self-giving hospitality. Her sister, Mary, assumes a different posture. By positioning herself at the feet of Jesus, she indicates her desire and her willingness to follow him in the lifelong journey of discipleship. And we quickly recognize that hers, too, is a very holy calling. You see, this isn't an either-or proposition. Christian discipleship cannot be summed up merely by speaking of service any less than it can be summed up by speaking only of learning. Both are required. The life of discipleship involves holding each of these in tension. Stanley Saunders observes that the problem is that Martha and Mary are not holding their parts together in partnership. Somehow the cord that makes these two women sisters in the household has become frayed. Luke describes Martha as distracted by her many tasks. And the verb that Luke uses here carries a sense of having one's attention so monopolized by something, even a necessary thing, that it threatens either to choke or to tear one apart. For us, I think that it serves as a reminder of how we are all prone to tunnel vision. Are we not? 
toward narrow-minded thinking? That it is our way that is the best way, or God forbid that our way is the only way? And once we establish that mindset, well, it's all too easy to become dismissive of everyone else, to criticize and to judge, which is exactly what happens in our second lesson this morning. Martha becomes the embodiment of that t-shirt. Maybe you have seen one. It reads in big, bold letters, I'm calling HR. Human resources, right? She wants to plead her case with upper management. And just listen to the words that she chooses. See if these sound familiar. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. It's the same challenge, isn't it? Almost an identical phrase, word for word, that the male disciples offered on those stormy seas. Do you not care that we are perishing? And as we all know, it's never easy feeling overwhelmed. Martha's problem, though, is that her service or her attention to these many tasks are now preventing her from seeing the bigger picture, the, the bigger picture that her service contributes to something else with a much deeper meaning. She sees only her parts and that exclusive focus now threatens to blind her and to rupture the household. Something similar might also be said for Mary, whose sitting and listening cannot go on forever, can it? Martha and Mary's partnership, their sisterhood, well, it's coming apart. They each have parts necessary for the whole, but they are not holding them in concert. The point here is that even good and necessary work can become a distraction, just as careful listening can pull us away from necessary doing. Or as Fred Craddock reminds us, there is a time to go and to do. There is a time to listen and reflect. Knowing which and when is a matter of discernment. This is also why if we were to ask Jesus which example applies to us, well, his answer would probably be yes. One of the greatest benefits of Scripture is its raw display of our humanity. The incisive questions that we dare not ask aloud. Do you not care, Jesus? And yet we get it, we understand this question at its core because we have felt the very same way. When our best intentions collided with the full force of the world's problems, and in those moments, the best that we can often muster is to place our head in our hands and to ask, Do you truly see me, Lord? May all thanks be to the God of love who sees us always, forgives us unconditionally, and loves us without ceasing. Hallelujah and Amen. I invite you now to please stand with me and join in affirming our faith together. Remembering the promise. 
to reconcile the world. God joined our humanity in Jesus Christ, the eternal Word made flesh. He is the long-awaited Messiah, one with us and one with God, fully human and fully divine, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of Mary. We are chosen in Christ to become like Him, and God's electing love sustains our hope. I invite you now to go out into the world proclaiming Christ in every corner, admonishing and teaching with all wisdom so that everyone can comprehend fully the presence and witness of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, I invite you now to receive the blessing of God whose mercy knows no end. Receive the blessing of Christ, who is patient and eager to give us a word of life. Receive the blessing of the Holy Spirit, who moves us and gives us power to do God's will. Receive the blessing of the triune God, and share this blessing joyfully with others. Thanks be to God. May it be so. Amen. Amen.